Mark. Yesterday marked five months on the job for Marty Meehan as president of the UMass system. Last time he joined us, he'd just recently been named to the job but hadn't yet taken office. He's back as president. Thanks for joining me, Marty Meehan. Thanks. You know, the original goal was to talk UMass, and we'll spend a few minutes, but obviously San Bernardino intervenes. You were in Congress for 14 years, able to cut deals on difficult things like campaign finance reform, the Republicans, John McCain, those kind of things. Why will this do-nothing Congress not even talk to each other in the wake of things like this? They all say they agree that mental health, mental illness issues should be addressed. So if they agree on the concept, why don't they even talk about the details? I think, Jim, on a night like tonight, the first thing that needs to happen is every American has to stop, take a step back, and ask themselves, what kind of country are we becoming? Mm -hmm. What kind of country do we want to be? And once we reject the notion that mass shootings are part of American life, then it's time to have a holistic approach to put pressure on Congress. The inability to limit access to guns, uh, the acceptance that, that, that American society, this, this, this is normal. It, it's Would this have happened, when you were there, I, I want to stay in the mental illness thing for a second. You got an F from the NRA, and let's assume there's a guy standing over there who got an A from the NRA. If you approached him 15 years ago, and said, I know we agree on almost nothing, but we agree that a mentally ill person of, defined as X should not have access to a weapon. Would he or she have sat down with you then, unlike now? Yeah, I, th I think they would have. So what I happened? Mean, we're, uh, I, I think both parties uh, uh, polarized. There isn't the interaction anymore. You know, we were talking before the show. I, I think of Senator Kennedy, and and he worked both sides of the aisle. And it's he, he urged everyone to. I mean, I, I I met Dom Rumsfeld for the first time at Ted Kennedy's house, and everyone was interacting and talking, and it, it, both sides aren't talking. I was a young staffer for Jim Shannon, who was a mm -hmm. former congressman from Massachusetts. I was 22 years old, working in Washington, D.C. Tip O'Neill used to play golf with Bob Michael every weekend. Everyone was talking. They were reaching agreement. Republican leader for those De don't Democrats that and Republicans. Yeah, and they just don't do it anymore. Okay, so let's leave Congress because it's probably a, a wasteful exercise for the moment. College presidents, let's talk macro and micro. You have a huge bully pulpit. All of you do. Uh, particularly people, what do you have 70,000 kids, hundreds yeah, of thousands 000, of yeah. alumni. What are you all doing about? Violence, and I don't just mean lobbying Congress. I don't mean on your campus. I mean in societal. What, well, kind of, what are you doing? What can you on, do? On big picture issues, you know, many of us will write op-ed pieces and talk about the need for Americans to think about what kind of society we'll want to be. But I think generally on issues, college presidents aren't really taking the bully pulpit the way they used to. There are a lot of pressures and demands on the job, whether it be fundraising and all the things you have to do that sometimes get in the way from. 30 or 40 years ago when college presidents used to actually use the position to speak out about issues of, of concern Is that because the they're worried of offending a, a parent Worrying who's of a donor or another offending one? Offending donors, offending political leadership, that type of thing. I think the job has changed such that, that, that now college presidents are careful about when and how they speak out, careful about how they're going to be perceived in the press. And, and I think a better system is for a college president to be able to speak the truth. That's what makes universities great places, the independence of thought, the independence of faculty, to have a dialogue about anything and be able to say what they want to say. University presidents ought to be the same way. Well, the whole question about free speech on college campuses is one for another day. Let's go to the micro part of this. When there's a shooting like there was in October, I think it was nine people, Umpqua Community College in, in Oregon, yeah. What do you do? I mean, what do you do to make sure that your kid, kids, your students are safe? You go back to look at what the policies are. We do that at all, all the UMass campuses. We look at, uh, you know, what we have for security personnel. We look to increase the number of police officers we have. We, we look to put more resources into technology to determine what are our best practices. We look at what our shooter on campus, and, and we, we have exercises as to what you we do. You do have do active shooter training we, and we that do, kind of yes, thing on campus? We do. We have, on all the UMass campuses, we have active training. Training. Not that you can necessarily prevent one, but you need to prepare as best you can. Do but increasingly, more and more resources go into this as well. Do those students, those 73,000 students, they're current students, correct? Yes. On the five campuses? Currently at UMass. Uh, do they know what to do? Do they know what the means of communication is from you or your lieutenants? assuming there was a dangerous situation on the we campus? We go through that with student government association, with student leadership. As a practical matter, with that many students, some students who are commuting, some students who live on campus, there is no way you can have that coordinated. So what we try to do is make sure that our 
police know what to do, the faculty know what best practices are, and that student leaders know what best practices are. You know, as I said, originally the intention was obviously to discuss none of these things, but horrible uh, situations intervene. I want to spend a minute or two, I, don't, I know you'll come back soon. It, during your inaugural speech, you pledged to elevate uh, uh, UMass, and with all due respect to the graduates, I'm sure you agree, there's the UVAs and the Michigans and the UCs. You're not quite in that range yet. Is it all about money? Is that, I mean, w no, what are the not. things that you need to make UMass what all of us say we want it to be, but most of us talk the talk and don't walk the walk? I think really it's about uh, pushing for excellence in everything that we do. How do you no push for excellence? Do, you develop strategic plans and then you hold people to it and you get, try to get people to get better. You reward success wherever you can. And I think if you look at what's happening, for example, on the Amherst campus, I think the chancellor there has a campus headed in the right direction. They've now risen in the uh, U.S. News and World Report rankings number 29 among public universities in the country. So it's demanding more. It's, it's evaluating how you're doing. It's assessing how you're doing and then going back to the deans and the faculty and say, how can we get this to a higher level? But debating that on all the campuses all the time. But accessibility and affordability, I assume you would agree, is a huge part of this, even Absolutely if it isn't is. all about... Uh, there's a recent study from the American Council on Education. The number of low-income recent high school grads who enroll in colleges dropped from 56% in 2008 to 45% in 2013. Is that because of the cost, because of remedial education needs? Why are those numbers dropped the so cost precipitously? And it's really across the board. It's some of the K through, through 12 programs that aren't working as well. We need to uh, uh, beef up on that. Our community colleges have open access. Students that go to a community college that get in that are successful mm -hmm. do well. UMass Boston, we have a program uh, there uh, with Enz uh, Genzyme Corporation to try to get more students to graduate, people of color. In STEM, UMass Boston is the only minority majority mm -hmm. campus. So uh, we're working at it, but uh, we're offering programs, two plus two. Uh, where someone can get a, a $30,000 degree if they spend two years at a community college and then two years at UMass. But it's getting the word out to students that they can get a degree for thirty to thirty. dollars But also 000. it's getting the word out to begin. You know, I, I know you've been in this thing with Stan Rosenberg. We don't have time for today, about $11 million. I know that matters, but $11 million in the grand scheme of things. No. I know I'm not running. It is not the salvation. No. Are we ever going to see a moment where there's an epiphany on Beacon Hill and like what happened with K through 12 in the mid 90s where they decided it's not going to be 3% or 2%. We're going to decide this really matters. UMass grads stay here. That That's the basis of our economy, the brains of our kids. Is that ever going to happen or is it all going to be incremental forever? That is a big priority that I have and frankly I spend more time on Beacon Hill probably than anyone who's ever been president. I have consistently been on the Hill working with legislators, educating legislators, getting them to understand that fundamentally the economy of Massachusetts drives through the University of Massachusetts. We educate the workforce of Massachusetts in technology and in innovation. Our research, we're third to, to Harvard and MIT. Uh, it's a $600 million research operation. Well, you convinced me. Now you only have to convince those 200 people. <laughs> I'll keep working. Marty, it. Mean, it's great Thanks, to see you. I hope you Thank come you. back soon. Thank you. I will. I will. Another kind of discussion.